It's okay. So you're going to have to tell me. It's fine. You look. There we are. I'm back. Cute and handsome. What's up, bud? So, uh, so yeah, we're recording now. And uh, first off, I just want to say it's nice to be back doing the podcast thing again. I've been on a hiatus for a little while, mental health, depression, BS, breaking through that. Now we're back on track. And so I wanted to hit you up because you I've known for, you're a Florida native, right? Were you born here? I am. Yeah. Okay. So I basically go and move here. Yep. Nice. Yeah. So I, I watched a documentary about the Everglades recently and my family grew, like I've had generations of family here in central Florida, grew up hunting, um, usually by white tailed deer, invasive hog species, that kind of stuff. And I was just thinking about all the cool stuff that Florida, like nature has to offer. Everyone thinks Florida, they think the theme park stuff like that. But then thinking about like the Everglades or like just airboating around central Florida, you got the St. John's River, you've got all kinds of great opportunity for hunting. And then you someone that is uh, prolific with like gator hunting. Like, you're one of the most, a- most avid hunters I know of. And that, I come from a family of pretty avid hunters myself. And it's something that I yeah. kind of took for granted growing up in, being able to go out hunting every weekend or go like now my dad's out every every weekend now do it, catching redfish, stuff like that. So it's always inundated with this Florida wildlife um, like lifestyle. And I realized like how how great that really was. And you're someone who... You kind of got into it, like your family wasn't into it. You said you know, your family was kind of anti-hunting and something like a path you. Kind yeah, of they're. Not, I, would, I, mean, I, yeah, I would call them anti-hunting. I mean, they're. We've been pro fishing. My family's been pro fishing for our whole lives. They've been fine with fishing. My grandfather, both my grandparents, uh, both my grandfathers were hunters, but it never translated into my father. My mother's, you know, big wildlife lover, but it's it's hard to teach somebody who, and she taught me to be a wildlife lover, and I do. But it's hard to teach somebody that once you get into hunting that I also love wildlife. I just enjoy eating it too. And it's I, I see it as a renewable resource. So right. Well, you know, we both love very, it. She just doesn't understand it. It's very counterintuitive to think like because hunters are some of the most prolific conservationists. Because For sure. when, when you're like that's one thing, like I'm you know how I stand think about government and taxing yeah. and that kind of stuff. But yep. one thing I'm fine with is like, like in my experience, at least from what I can see, FWC, the Florida Wildlife Commission, does a decent job. I'm fine paying for a hunting license if I know it's going to conservation efforts, if it's going to take care of the land and the water systems and and maintain the ecosystems. Because I mean Florida's ecosystem is under attack with the Everglades of invasive species, like Burmese pythons, all kinds of monitor lizards coming in. And of course, we've got like hogs we deal with. I mean, there's no there's no hunting season for hogs because they're invasive. You, they reproduce rapidly. You can always hunt them, and, and it's great eating. Why not? So, so those who tend to hunt, or, or pe- those who look outside, those who are outside hunting and look at it, think like, oh, you're just killing animals, or you're trophy hunting, or like, why can't Correct. you just go trophy buy trophy hunting from, is the big one, right? Or why can't you just go buy, um, you know, food from the grocery store? You buy and store meat, or why do you have to eat meat at all, or Right, you know. right. So I wanted to talk a bit about how, like, the conservation side of it as well. We're like, we need to keep these populations in check so the ecosystem doesn't get more out of whack, you know. Right. And then something that goes into that too is like when you think about endangered species, like, it's particularly in Florida. You know, think about alligators. You know, and they're not. Are they? Are we still endangered? God no. I mean, threatened? that's the only reason we can hunt. They're not only not only are they not endangered, but we have more. We have more per state than any other state, which is crazy when you think about it. Versus like Louisiana, you know, that has has the swamps they have like untouched land right we still have more of them so it's a growing population the thing is with alligators it's a reptile it's a different type of you know everyone loves them i love them too it's you know it's it is my favorite animal and it's weird when pe- all i ever hear is you're a trophy hunter you know you care about this you care about that they don't i'm looking i'm on the water looking at these animals even if i'm not hunting on them or if i'm not hunting them like i'm looking at them pretty frequently but most every week i'm on the water looking at them you know, I remember, and it, I like learning how to hunt them. Yeah. But I like outsmarting. That's the chase is what it is. And if they, they win the majority of the time, that's fine. And that's something that people think about too, because there's different kinds of hunting. There's different ways you can challenge yourself. Like you can do bow hunting versus rifle hunting, or even yep. just like stalking versus using a stand or a feeder. Yep. You know, so like there are times like a lot of my family, they would do stand hunting or, or yep. blinds. And, you know, a lot of times like I'm, it, it depends on the animal that comes in there. If I see like an older an older buck or something that's probably not going to be breeding a lot yeah. or maybe threatening the younger ones, then okay, I feel fine taking that out. But if I got like yeah. a six inch spike coming in there or like a 2.4 point, whatever, I'm probably going to let yeah. it walk, you know, but it all, it all depends, you know, um, but these are all things that, that factor into it. And I think it's really cool talking with people that understand the conservation aspect of it who really, because like few people really respect and love wildlife than those who are out there in it, part of that 
like part of the chain of the ecosystem. Because like, how else can yep. you really be part of that food chain if you're actually actively hunting and going and gathering your meat? Because when you when you shoot a buck or when you catch a gator or any kind of animal that you harvest yourself, there is such a profound respect for that usually. At least in my case, and then knowing where your meat comes from, and knowing it's not some factory farm where the animals cooped up, standing on their own shit with a bunch of other animals all the time. Like I think factory farming is 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 disgusting in so many ways. And I think that that you know, obviously not everyone's gonna be able to hunt. It's not sustainable for everyone to get their meat that way, but those who can, there's multiple benefits to it. I think everyone should try it. I think so too. I don't think I, it, I don't think it's set up for everybody, and everybody's not gonna enjoy it. But the, you know, the the main issue is we are the argument against us, and and. I'm one of the few people because I'm obviously friends with tons of hunters and I like to keep an open mind and keep, keep friendships within social media with people that aren't hunters, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they constantly, I mean, there's, there's people that some people you just have to regulate and I have to delete them or whatever, because it just gets to the point where it's threatening, but I'm willing to talk to anybody about the hunting from my side. And that's something that America's got completely away from. And that's the only way we're going to get back on everything, every political view, every single thing that everything's, you know, people stand against each other on, whether it's gun ownership or, you know, anything politics, yeah. you know, red versus blue or this or that. The problem is nobody's willing to sit down and have a real talk and be open minded. People, people now will have a conversation and they're going to have a conversation because they want to tell you their points, but they don't want to hear yours. And from, uh, you know, there, I've always, I've always felt I have a good spot to sit at. So I've always told people, like, if you want to have a real conversation, I'll do it with you. And I'll tell you why, because I was raised anti-hunting. I was raised, you don't need to hunt. I was raised, you know, essentially, you don't have a heart for the animals if you're a hunter. I just decided to do it one day as an outdoorsman. And it's, it's so much more than that. And if somebody's willing to be open-minded enough to go out there and try it, whether or not you kill something, that's what they have to realize is a good day hunting has nothing to do with, with being successful as far as killing an animal. There's, there's success outside. Like I consider a successful gator hunt. If I either, you know, if I killed a gator, great. Awesome. Cool. Especially if it's somebody like, I don't, I personally don't care if I kill gators anymore. Like I've done what I needed to do. I've proved it to myself. I, I can figure out the animal. What I like to do now is take new people out, show them the outdoors. They learn so much about the outdoors and the problem is kids kids in general like i have a 12 year old son and a nine or an eight year old daughter and what's happened is they've gotten away from seeing the outdoors so nobody cares about the environment anymore mm -hmm. and it's not so much conservation which i i can i can make a million points on conservation it's about if people go experience florida or any state because every state has a has a completely different ecosystem and florida has 10 different ecosystems that's what's crazy about the state but if you go if you go experience this you have a wide a much wider view on how small you are you and you and you understand that we are animals when you're out there because that gator does not care that i'm a human that i'm smarter than it that it's this or that that gator will kill me if it wants to if it can if it has the opportunity and good for him you know that's what he should do that's what he knows to do and that's what he should do but it's not even about that it's getting out there and i love watching people and they're like you know what the stars going out there and seeing it and it's crazy to think that like People are shocked about seeing stars, but that's how many houses we have now. As people don't see stuff like that, being able to see the Milky Way, seeing gators' eyes shine, watching the clutches of babies hatch, and you'll see them pop up overnight, and they realize, because I've been out there, I'm able to tell them about stuff, and that, you know, it's not all sweet. Like, gators are, are cute animals, but it's not all sweet. Like, 1% of, of alligators survive. And it's because male gators go eat the baby gators, and turtles eat them, and birds eat them. And then at some point, they become an apex predator, and then nothing touches them minus humans or right. other alligators. That's it. So it's getting people out there and teaching them it. And that's, that's, that's the biggest thing about hunting is it's not about a success story. In the beginning, any hunter, that is what it's about. But as you get better with it and as it, you know, like it's, that's not what it's about to me. It's about taking a break from reality. Like go somewhere where your phone doesn't have service. Mm -hmm. Go somewhere where you don't even want to look at your phone. You don't think about it. You know, take your friends out there, have experiences, drink some beers out there, watch the stars see animals you've never seen before like that's the stuff that it was all about to to all of us most of us and and they think we're just bloodthirsty monsters it is what it is and some some people are willing to talk about it some aren't 
you're right. And so getting back to what you're saying about like having the conversations for that, maybe for like polarizing topics, like when it comes to like politics, red versus blue, hunting yeah. versus not hunting, like, like, like you're absolutely right. That's the reason I was really passionate about getting back into this podcast is because I want, I want to bridge some gaps. I want to have conversations. I want to understand people, right? you know, and I want to share the understanding that I've learned with other people as well, because like we see so often in, um, in, in, in the media, we see like everyone's having free speech debates about Twitter. Who's buying this? Who's doing yeah. that? Who controls this? And it's like, well, listen, if, if a lot of bad ideas are being put out there, let's talk about some good ideas. Let's put some more like somewhat like I'm trying to create basically a rational counterculture that's that's able to rationalize things and think things through. Yeah. Try to like, take a breath and understand someone. Like don't don't listen to someone to get your reply ready. Listen to them to understand what they're saying. Yeah. And you don't necessarily at the end of it mean you're gonna agree with them. That's fine. Right. Like that's you said, fine. not everyone, not everyone's gonna be a hunter. But at the end of the day, you have to realize, and everyone like from a hunter's aspect. A conservation aspect, you have to realize that every every human being on this earth right now that's alive is here because one of your forefathers was a really good hunter. If they weren't, you wouldn't be here. So that is you can you can be upset about it and you can say we're at a new day, we're at a new age, but it's it's I can tell you that I know a million hunting families and hunting is killing aside. Those children have a much better connection with their parents and have a much better understanding of the, like they have a better friendship with their parents, not just parent to child. They have a true friendship with their sons and daughters by getting in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And that's why, I mean, that's, that's why I like taking other people out now. And that's why I do a lot of youth hunts and do, because watching these parents and it could be the one time a year that their kids gone out there or, or their once ever that they've gone out there. And it's a, it's a memory that you catch with that, that, that carries on. And I'm tired of seeing houses built everywhere, which is ironic because I build houses every day. Yeah. But but I'm tired of seeing it. You know, mm -hmm. like I'm like every day I drive by in a new cut of woods that I used to go explore the woods in, not even hunting, just walk through those woods. And I'm like, man, I used to, you know, as kids, we went through here, we went through there. Orange groves have all disappeared in Florida. This, I mean, dude, it's so sad. I, I grew it's up by the, uh, by the Sanford Zoo um, right there near Lake Monroe. So like seeing the way, like, I mean, I love what Sanford's done with the riverfront area. It's beautiful. But right. seeing all that development, like I, like I lived on dirt road. There were woods across the street from me. I would go there. We had, there's a big ass pine tree right across there. We called yeah. it the Eagle Tree. A family of bald eagles was there. And we would go in there every other day. We'd go to the bottom of the tree. We'd find fish bones, rabbits bones whatever we could find everything Sometimes you find owl pellets and we learned so much about the environment and and then part of being out there in the nature too like it's it's, it's a profound call back to the way things used to be to like what you mentioned right. our ancestors because you think okay when you're out there hunting for an animal you think okay yeah i've got a sandwich back in the cabin or on the truck or whatever but when you think put yourself in your ancestors shoes out there with a bow and an arrow or a spear maybe, right depending where they came yep. from you're like if you don't if you if you don't you know successfully finish this hunt and harvest an animal you don't eat you don't ha you don't eat you, you don't, don't eat survive. your children don't eat nobody right. eats so like right. putting yourself in that kind of like primal circumstance is, is something that it, i think it, it it humbles us and it really expands our perspective and, and really makes us grateful for what we have you know it's like okay yeah i'm i'm, I'm eating ramen right now basically it's not a lot of food yeah. it's terrible for me whatever but you, you know right. what like i have that convenience like if i'm hungry all I, in, in three and a half four minutes i can go down there and i can have a meal and i can be okay you know well that's that's a big thing that's happened is is the biggest i mean the a hundred percent of our arguments that we have between all of us the population of america is because we have like we are we are quote unquote the greatest country as far as freedom as far as what we have at our fingertips you don't have to go get food you don't have to there's nothing that's why so many people argue why should you do that to them or why should you do this or anything gun ownership how you know what you know can your can your child be gay you're talking about arguments that is pretty ridiculous in every in in every third world country they're like you you're really talking about this right now you know, I, me and my son and my parents traveled to Africa and there's not a conversation of should you go out and kill an animal? Like that's how you're eating. You know, they get paid 90 cents a day, a day, you know? And it, when I say there, there, there's kids my daughter's age that are watching groups of goats, 200 goats, and that's their job. All, they don't go to school. They're farmers. Mm -hmm. And there's not a parent with them. They're left to watch those goats that day. And you're talking about a country that has leopards that has cheetahs, that has lions, that will kill that child. And it happens all the time. If they go down to the water, crocodiles. Oh, hippos. It is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, you know? And we have, 
we have we have it so good here that we can complain about little things. So that's what's happened is we're able to, you know, and, and we shouldn't because at the end of the day, I'm I'm fully understanding and I respect somebody's right to, to not want to hunt. Like you said, not everybody has to. That's fine with me, man. It really is. But you shouldn't take my freedom away because I want to. Because here's right. the deal. If you wear leather, you're part of it. If you eat any sort of meat, you're part of it. If you're a, a vegan or a vegetarian, minus taking care of and minus growing all of your own food, you have killed trillions of vegans kill more animals than anybody else. They kill trillions of insects that we need. Ground nesting because birds, their food small has rodents. Yeah, well, they, the monocrop agriculture is absolutely horrendous. Not only for like the soil and the territory, but like again, like the like small ground animals, um, rodents, ground Everything. nesting birds. Like I mentioned, like so many get absolutely just brutalized by these massive harvesters. Yep. So like there is no there is like, everyone that eats anything. If you if you buy anything from the supermarket, there's blood on your hands. You know, so at one point it's just and that's not like, a bad thing. And that's the problem that people need to understand. That's not it's not necessarily like we are we are predators naturally. The mm -hmm. humor is if you have two a toothache as a kid, you go get teeth taken out because you don't need those teeth anymore because we don't eat the same food. But those teeth were there to chew meat back right. in the day. I like I literally wouldn't get mine taken out because I'm like no. I mean, recently <laughs> I went to the dentist and they're like, you don't need them anymore. I'm like, oh, I need them. Well, I like your wisdom teeth. You know, I do it. I, I there's not. If you think that I pull the trigger on a deer and I'm laughing about it, I'm not. You know, I pull the trigger on a deer and I respect that animal and that's fine. I look at it as a different, I'll look at a deer outside of deer season and think it's beautiful and I'll see it in deer season and still think it's beautiful. But I also, under, I look at it as food. Mm -hmm. I mean, in co COVID taught us more than a lot of things. So COVID, in my opinion, was a very good thing for everybody as far as teaching us how much government regulation there should be. And everyone said, you don't need to hunt. You don't need to hunt. And instantly there was no food. I not once did I ever worry about it. I have thousands of pounds of meat at my house and if i need more i'll go get more i mean i don't i don't we don't really go buy meat minus like chicken yeah you know but all the fish we eat all the you know we eat deer when we want red meat occasionally we'll go buy steaks but most of the time it's deer meat you know if we want if we want to smoke something i'm going to smoke a wild pig ham all mm -hmm. this stuff is fine and dandy and i understand it and i and i know the animals are cute and i know they're pretty but at the end of the day you got to realize that it is a renewable resource and if you don't control it Everyone, all the anti-hunters or all the anti-people in general for, for where I'm at. Because some people, they don't necessarily, against hunting, they just don't think we need to kill them. They think we're bloodthirsty. That's not what it's about. And they'll say, you don't need to do this. And you're right. Oh, nature will take care of itself. You're right. It will. You know how it does? Disease. Disease and famine. They starve to death or they get diseased and they die. There's no such thing as a good, easy death. No animal has ever laid down and went to sleep and died naturally because of old age in wild. Right. That's the problem. It's but usually a do, brutal agonizing death. Like if like a bear or an alligator gets them, like it's it's not a it's not a good clean death. That's something that hunters really strive. Like every almost every hunter I've ever spoken with, and especially anyone that I respect or be willing to associate with, takes like harvesting the killing of the animal extremely seriously. We want to make yeah, sure absolutely. you have a good shot. You don't want you don't want to injure the animal and have it run off because a the, not at all. A the animal suffer. You don't want the animal to suffer. And then B, I mean, it's, it's harder to find practically as well. But like you want, you want, like I've only, I've only actually harvested a couple um, white deer in my time, like, or white tail deer in my time. Mostly I go there, I look at stuff, I end up heading back. But mostly because my dad or my brother's already harvested something and the breeze is already full. But I I love just being out there in nature. And then with the ones I have harvested, I made very, very sure I get that clean shot because you want them to go down. You don't want them to have that painful death. You want them to go down easy and you want to respect right. the animal that way too. Because if you don't harvest these animals, you know, think about this way. If these animals overpopulate in some places um, where you see a lot more hunting regulations, um, animals overpopulate. And what happens then? You have government agencies go out and they just call them. They just shoot them from helicopters and these bodies are rot there. When you have hunting, yeah. a healthy hunting community, these animals are being harvested. The skins and the meats being used productively for to support society. That's not well, you have these, these states, the Midwest states majorly, have disease and stuff that happens when these populations are massive. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have enough technology now we can figure out what proper numbers are. And, and I keep, I'm going to keep going back to alligators because I know a lot about it. And because we're talking about Florida, yeah. but like, like alligators are a perfect example, but sitting on that deer in the Midwest, you have chronic waste disease, you have blue tongue disease, you have a million different diseases. 
and it's because of overpopulation. It's because of cattle grazing, because the cattle, the cattle will give uh, whitetail diseases that they've never had before, and so they don't have, they can't combat it. Their their bodies can't combat it. And so I'm not against the the, the cattle community. I don't care. But if I have a choice, I'm going to much prefer the animal that I. I mean, he has freedom of life, mm-hmm. however long or short that is, freedom of life. And in a moment, within 10 seconds, he's dead. And, and people say, oh, they, you know, they live in pain or they mourn or they this or they that. They don't. I'm going to tell you right now, they don't. And if you're going to argue with me because you saw something on TV or you saw this article, or you saw that, I'm, on, I'm in the woods or on the water five to six days a week. You know, it's, it's a career path that I just chose. I just took a job to do this. I see this stuff day in and day out. So you may have read something that's cute. I've seen it. I've seen it all. When you tell me these, oh, look at this, this, this baby alligator on a mom's back. The mom will protect the baby, but the father is going to come eat the baby. Yep. It's what they do. And the only reason that father is eating that baby is not because it's hungry. That father's eating that baby because it's competition in 20 years. That's what's nuts. So with alligators, the, the biggest argument against us, I mean, they've kept us. This is the first year. So we have 24-hour hunting this year in our season. We have a 77-day season. It's August 15th to November 1st. We're allowed. It's an extremely tight lottery. So 19,400 people applied this year. Okay, so let's talk about how that, how that works, too, with the lottery. So basically you apply for a certain number of tags the state allocates to you. And how's the lottery right. work? Is it is it just random who applies, gets some? Or it's, is it so the, the lottery how many tags you got random, last year? But you apply to, so you're going to apply to a specific lake or okay. waterway. You know, so on the St. John's, they'll, they'll block it in sections. And it's usually channel markers or rivers, that, you know, uh, connecting channels and stuff like that that they'll block it off at. So okay. you'll pick a section that you want to hunt. Most people pick close to their house. You apply for it. They give you 12 choices. So you'll, you'll pick your 12 choices. And each choice is technically four choices because it's a 77-day season. But the first month, each week, the first four weeks is an individual week. So if I apply for Lake County, Lake County, I can hunt everything in the county that's public waters that's not considered an AMU, which is an alligator management unit. So if I apply for that, I can apply for week one, two, three, and four. If I get week two, I cannot hunt week one, three, or four. I can only hunt the first week out of the month. I can only hunt one week out of the first month once you get your tax. But the thing is, it's become popular. Mm -hmm. Some people say reality shows. And if you want my opinion, a lot of what's become the popularity of it just this year as we had record numbers of applications is COVID. People got outdoors more and you can't, nothing was open. So they got truly outdoors. This is why I say it was a good thing for America. I think it's a good thing for everybody, but it's a good thing for America. People got out. They went to parks. They went to lakes. They went, they went and experienced stuff. And these kids, I promise you, my kid's never going to remember in the future his, the, a video game battle that he had that was epic. But he'll remember an epic hunting trip or an epic fishing trip, even if we didn't kill anything. It's a, it's, it's a memory of the first manatee that came up and he saw it, it sw- he's, you know, it swam up to him. That's incredible. You know, the first time you heard a gator bellow in the swamp, I mean, it's something that it literally sounds like a dinosaur. It's such and a And you realize sound. how small you are when you hear this stuff, when you see this stuff, you realize we're just one more of them. We're just far more advanced, you know? Yeah. And, and so we, I go to these lakes. I'll, I, most of the lakes you hunt now are populated. You know, there's houses on a mil- $5 million, $10 million houses on these lakes. And what happens is these people come in from other states that have never seen alligators, but they also don't want lights sh- shining in their windows. Yeah. So they'll call Fish and Game or the Sheriff Department when they see us gator hunting. They don't, don't want us there. It's, it's part of the system. We've been here forever. We've been here, I think gator season's been open for a couple of years longer than I am old. So it's probably 38 or 39 years it's been open. So that's, that's when they get off the endangered species list. And every year we hunt, the population grows. So, which is wild to think because it's like a one cer- 1% survival rate. Right. Well, species. we're thinking about it, like what's killing a lot of the gator. Like, young gators are extremely vulnerable, but a lot of those, like you said, are being killed by the larger yeah, gators. Yeah, they're vulnerable. If you get rid of like some of these... Feet. Yeah, you get rid of some of these older non-breeding males that are just being yeah. a-holes and, and competing for territory, then you give yep. the population room to expand. Yep. I mean, you go, we'll get the biggest gator, the biggest gators I catch every year 
if you roll them upside down, their whole bottom side, their whole belly scarred up, massive teeth holes in them and everything. And these are 12, these are 11, 12 foot alligators. And you're saying, what is attacking that? Other alligators. Yeah. So there's always something bigger. There's always something there. And that's, you know, there, there really isn't, if you're going to look at wildlife properly, don't sit there and tell me bear or cute. You know, you go to Yellowstone, how many videos you see a, every year of Yellowstone, buffaloes killing people or at least mauling them, elk too. Oh yeah, There's when you people... think about like bears being cute, all of the, the cuddly teddy bear and stuff, like yeah. bears are absolutely savage. They eat yeah. animals alive from the ass in. Yeah, like, like wolves. I mean, they, that's they, what... most animals don't die well. No, no animal dies well. I mean, you go anywhere; it's either you're lucky if you get hit by something that that chokes you out. Right. But but ninety nine percent of animals, they're while you're alive, they're eating you wherever they catch you. Terrific. Like you said, hyenas eat from the ass end up. You know, cheetahs, uh, leopards, both grab from the throat and they'll choke you out. So thank God that. But half the animals they do, they wait till the animal passes out and then they start eating them. It's not dead. Right. It just has passed out. So where's your argument with it? Because I'll have mine, you know, but, you know, that's what I tell everyone. I'm like, it, you can have your argument. But what I always encourage people is go look at it. Go see it. Go experience it. And then you tell me. Because gator hunting has, has been something not only fulfilling for me and my kids, but on top of that, everyone I've literally only taken one person gator hunting that never wanted to go again, and it's my girlfriend. It's Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because she was terrified of it. But everyone that, yeah. else was, I want to do it one time and I want, you know, I want to have that experience and then I want yeah. to be done. And then they go on that adventure and they realize it's not about killing a giant alligator. It's about the stuff you see, the experiences you have. And you feel so small compared to these animals. And it, I mean, it teaches you. It teaches you that because we as humans, I mean, you have anything you want at your fingertip at any point. I mean, we feel above anything, but we're not. We're really not. We're just smarter. And we really aren't that much smarter because we have to outsmart animals with, with brains the size of my pinky you know right well they're, they're so like evolved to be, be quick and, and efficient and, and and i mean like the the, the reflexes of a white-tailed deer or it's like, insane it's, it's absolutely ridiculous yeah they have their like a white-tailed deer has essentially every sense they can smell incredible they can see incredible they can hear incredible they're they've locked it all down you well, know they've like evolved, a turkey. They evolved to compete with like bears and and uh and yeah. Florida panthers and like yep. other like apex predators yep so they've got to be quick, otherwise it wouldn't a be. One, a one-year-old deer can outsmart most people. You know, a turkey can't smell anything. They're really good on noise, but they can their sight, they can see the white of your eyes from like a quarter mile away. Think about that for a second. That's a crazy. bird, That's a crazy. bird, a two-year-old bird is is you know, they're they're starting to come out of like a three-year-old bird starts to that's a mature bird at that point. Yeah. Turkeys outsmart me every time. And I still hunt them, not because I'm a successful turkey hunter i hunt them because that's what's fun to me is they outsmart me and then i want to learn that so that's that is the beauty of the outdoors and it's it's not even that like there's this turkey season i went out we went hunted and we're sitting there and a coyote came out we had another hunt where a bobcat came out you know and so you see stuff that that's just not normal people are going to see it's, it's not it's, just a bobcat so right cool. across the road you're talking about you see the bobcat and the best feeling in the world is when that animal who is designed to see you can't see you. And so you just get a chance to sit back and watch them and experience what they experience. And, and, and it's incredible, you know, and the conservation aspect of it is if I guarantee you, if, ha if every single one of these anti hunters, what we got to realize is we're all here for the same reason. They want conservation. We want conservation. Mm -hmm. Now we want it for different reasons, you know, and they're going to say, well, you just want conservation because there's more animals to hunt. But at the end of the day, isn't that still conservation? It's a win-win. You know, the population of the animals are healthier. Then, we're healthier. Well, we have more what food What we sustainably. hope is that each state uses their biologist and their, and their funding to learn what the proper amount of, of animals is for alligators. Everyone says, well, just leave them alone. You cannot have lakes with as many alligators as you want because there's houses everywhere. So what the, what perfect example again, alligators, like a nuisance alligator program in Florida 
if you need to call somebody, if you have alligators that are a nuisance, you call a hotline, it goes to fishing game, they call a private trapper, that trapper comes out and catches the alligator. They don't relocate alligators. Everyone says they do, it's, that's, that's gone. Anything under, I think it's four foot. Anything under four foot, nobody really messes with. Anything over four foot is dead. Yeah. It's, it's gone. So if you call in a nuisance gator, they don't move them to another lake. So if people believe that, that's terrible. And you know why nuisance gators are called? Because people feed them, which I hate. Like, let that animal be wild. Let yeah. them not like humans, because that's what they're supposed to do. The second you make it habituated to humans, they see us as a source of food, whether it's us personally or food we feed them. So we go to these, we go to these lakes and we hunt and people don't like us there, but you got to realize if you don't, the state can either make money or lose money. We, could, we as hunters pay for funding. Trappers, they have to pay. So if we're not here to hunt them, the same amount of gators are killed. The same amount of deer are killed. The same amount of every species is killed. It's just on the hush hush. People don't know about it. And you're not funding the research to find out what the healthy populations are. You're not finding out about how to track things like chronic wasting disease or whether things happening to healthy populations or how to combat right. them. So, um, dude, I could talk to you about this for hours. Unfortunately, I, I, my software, my using a free version of this, it's it giving me a minute until it locks me out. I didn't realize uh, it had that. Now Zoom updated and it's being a pain in the ass. Apparently I have to pay some money to make this last longer. But um, so we got about a minute left. Um, that last words, we want to talk about anything real quick before we sign off and it cuts us off here. We'll do it again I got for no, sure I mean, get outdoors. But... Go outdoors. Go experience life. Yeah, we'll do, I'll do get another one phone. sometime. Yeah, another one sometime. I'm setting this into about... an iPad, by the way. <laughs> I love it. Um, we'll do another one sometime where we talk more about the in-depth part of gator hunting. So I want to get into that, but unfortunately the time constraints here are screwing me a little bit, but everyone, thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions or anything, hit me up. I can spread them on and uh, learn some more about conservation, and how to get along with nature in great ways. So thank you everyone for listening. Nick, thank you, bro. Appreciate you. And uh, I'll be in touch soon. Thanks everybody. Yes, sir. Bye. Hey, brother. Let me see you, man. There we go. All right, cool. So we decided that the 40 minute like limit that my free software has wasn't enough. So we're trying to splice this together. So um, but what I, wanted to, what I wanted to get in talking about, so we talked about gator hunting a lot. Um, and I want to I want to hear more about the way that works, especially in Florida, because you mentioned to me when we were off the air a minute ago that it's different from like the show, like everyone thinks of swamp people when they think about gator hunting. So that's like Louisiana predominantly, uh, if I remember correctly. But like Florida is a different kind of situation. We don't set the traps for what you said. So I'd love for you to break down, like what's a night of gator hunting like for you? Well, so the, before anything, the difference between them and, and us is we consider it um, a hunt and they're doing it, they're doing it as it's considered trapping. So they're doing it for purely for numbers management and they lease a section of river and they get that section. They're the only person that's allowed to hunt that section of river and they go hunt it. And their goal is to kill that number of alligators out of that section of river. If they don't kill that number of alligators, then they don't get as many tags next year. Oh, so they're, we have they're obligated to fulfill it. Uh, the tag their, their, their goal is to fill, fulfill it, not only for money for them, but for, for the state, which is technically what we have, but Florida doesn't want um or does not want the general public to know i mean it's a melting pot here so we don't have it's this is not necessarily a pro hunting state it's not necessarily an anti-hunting state it's just a state and it has everybody here everybody moves here everybody talks crap about florida but everybody ends up moving here one so thing i love about florida is florida is very much like do what you want to do yeah you know, within a certain yep. restraints, basically it's like, look, you're you're an adult, do your thing. As long as you're not violating other people's rights or harming things, you know, deliberately, do your thing. Yep. So that what they so how Florida does it and what they do is it's not just it's just not based on nothing. It's not there's not an unlimited number of tags. So they have an allotted number of tags every year. They have an allotted number of animals that they want taken out. And they do they do basically animal census, correct? That's how they can determine like what yeah, the population so every year are, they what they healthy have population biologists is. Biologists go out there and do a an alligator count. So they do flyovers with with helicopters. They do on the water with airboats. I don't I don't know how much they actually do, and I think it should be done more because some of the areas I think are are there's too many tags given, but they'll they'll count the number of alligators total, and they'll count the number of alligators that they consider a bull, which is an adult male. And then they factor in 
if we saw X amount of alligators, there's this many more that we didn't see. So they have an estimated number population on, on every lake, on every waterway in the state of Florida. That's a and lot so, of waterways in the state of Florida. It's, it's all water. It's absolutely so they, insane. That's what they do is they manage, like I'm not, we're not allowed to hunt anywhere. You know, it's not like we can just pick a spot and go. We have to, we have select areas and there's boundaries within that. You know, there's, there's tons of areas that we're not allowed to hunt because they're sanctuaries and that's great. That's their animals need an area to go to, to not be pressured. That's awesome. Right. And it, it gives them an area to go where, you know, small alligators aren't killed and big alligators aren't killed. So each section is always, there's no way, there's no way to, to overkill our population now. It did happen. It has happened. And so that's the conservation thing. You know, they're like buffaloes were hunted to the brink of extinction. Mm -hmm. Elk were, turkeys were, every species has been, but we've evolved. So this is generations ago that this happened. Where we are now with it is we we control it by by having hopefully mindful biologists that take n proper numbers and then they allocate tags to, to take the numbers away from it. The, the reason we can hunt and the reason there's more hunting opportunities every year is because the animal growth is more than we kill, which is good, but the growth of land is not there. There's never there's never more land than there was. There's always less. Right. And so what happens every year is they give us more tags because there's less water to hunt that's wild. And so they'll pick the number of alligators that they want gone that they consider still a, a viable resource, like a very healthy population, but they're not mm -hmm. competing for each other. Because there's areas that I go and you'll kill a 10 foot alligator and he weighs 100 pounds, which is unsafe. I mean, they get, it's, they're sick. They're sick animals because they can't compete. You know, a, a 10 foot alligator needs a big food source. Right. And there's a bunch of them. So they'll try and take some of them away and so that there's not competition for the food. And so the, the animals that are left thrive. That's the idea of the conservation from a hunting aspect. So they pick these numbers and they give them to us knowing that X amount of percent of people are going to be successful with their hunt. So they they've taken 30 years of records and you can look at the records. It's all public, public source. You know, it's public information. You could go on fish and game and look the percentage of success rate on each lake for the last 15 years, 20 years. That's something I'm really glad you brought up too, because a lot of people think if you're not acquainted with the way hunting works and the way the licensing works and the way the, at least the Florida Wildlife Commission works, like you think that it's, it's some good old boy system. You grab your rifle, go out in the woods or go out Correct. in the swamp and you start harvesting stuff. It's, it's not willy nilly. Like there's, there's, I mean, it, the science always could improve, but like there's a lot of resources that go into making sure that this is going to be a sustainable event that not only does not harm the environment, but ultimately will end up benefiting it. Like I said, like we talked about before, allowing other species to thrive, to regain their numbers. And again, taking out some of the older bull gators like that, it seemingly can, can allow some of the younger ones to survive, get to breeding age and increase the numbers that way as well. So I'm glad that's, you brought I mean, that up. There's a lot involved. That's what it is at the end of the day. It's not just that. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you brought up a point where we were talking earlier about Burmese pythons and stuff in the Everglades. And there, here's the deal. There's really no hunting in the Everglades. Right. So, and they're having drastic, drastic, drastic numbers drop of whitetail. Raccoon you know? populations and are having, decimated and right. like small, and so, small ground So mammals. they're saying, well, you know, people that don't want the pythons killed because they're like, just let them live. They're beautiful animals. That's cool, but they're not supposed to be here. Wild hogs are not supposed to be here. Right. So it's not, I mean, they're here forever. They're never going to disappear. No. Both, every, every animal that's introduced into the wild will always be here. That's the beauty of Florida is we don't have harsh winters. I mean, so we don't have so that, much. Yeah, we don't have stuff that, that stops them. So the only thing that can stop them is us, and we have to be allowed to do it. So for, for gator hunting is we, we're a lot of these number of tags, and we're allowed to go out and take these animals, but most of the people don't. I mean, there's, there's tags as low as a percent rate of 0% kill in an wow. area. And they, but they only gave two tags for the area, so it's probably a small area to hunt. I was looking this up two days ago talking to somebody. Perfect. But the average, I mean, the average percent of success is probably anywhere from mid 30s up to like 50s, not even 50s, mid 30s to mid 40s. That's your success rate. So even though tags are being allocated, they're not 100 percent being filled. So a lot of these animals, like even the, so the percentage, so the percentage of animals, as I say, the Wildlife Commission looks at, okay, well we we can cull basically, or we can harvest this many animals and still maintain a healthy population. You're not reaching that that number. That not even close. Cool. You're getting not maybe half of that if you're lucky. Yeah, if you, I mean, it, on a great year, you're you're talking about half. Half is there, okay. you know. And the the argument. 
from, from my side is, is they give more numbers for that the next year. And it's a reptile. It's not like a, a mature deer is three and a half, four and a half years old. A mature alligator is 20 years old. You know, you're talking about, well, a mature, a mature where it's sexual maturity is, is about seven years old. Uh, but, but like a big, what they consider a bull, a nine-year-old alligator, you know, they're, they're 15, 20 year old animals. They've, they've seen, they've seen us hunt them. It's not easy to hunt them. So it's not swamp people style. We can't hang baits. We go actually physically hunt the animal. So it's no different than a deer hunt or anything other than how we hunt them, but we can snatch hook them, which is just a big treble hook on a rod. We're allowed to harpoon them, which is extremely hard because you have to get real close. And yeah, that's the only way. Difficult. Yeah, you drive right up to them and harpoon them. But the only way to do that, um, big on big animals, it really doesn't happen. On airboats, it does, but but on a normal, like I'm, I run a mud motor, so I have in between an outboard and an airboat. So it's success rates not real high for us for for that type of hunting. Um, outboards, it's pretty low too. Airboats, they can do that, but airboats have their faults as well, so they can't snatch open. So we all have our faults and there's the, the, the beauty of gator hunting. What, what I, was, I was one of the angry old timer gator hunters for years and I didn't want new people joining it because it made it harder for me to get taxed. I used to mm -hmm. get taxed wherever I wanted, whenever I wanted, you know, within season. Like you're going to get tags every season. It's just to where because you have to apply to an area. And now I've gone seven years without getting taxed. Oh, and wow. that's fine. So that this year they had 19, uh, over 19,000 people apply. And there were 7,400 permits. Wow. So is there anything yeah, so, that increases your chances of getting tags or is it pretty much random? It's so what it does essentially is everybody applies. They give you like two weeks to apply and then a, a, they have a virtual name and a hat deal. And it's not that you get tags. Your name and the hat is for your number. You get allocated a number and then they run down from one to infinity to whoever applies and if you get drunk, so if you're the first person that applies, it starts on your application. You get 12 choices. So it picks your first choice. If you're the first person, you're going to get it. You know, if you're the, if you're the 19,000th person, unless you picked a tag that's not available or not available or still available completely, you're not going to get tags. So I haven't got, I apply for really high end hunts. I apply for areas that have big alligators because that's what I enjoy hunting. I like mm -hmm. to hunt a small alligator is not real hard. To hunt a small, a young deer is not real hard. Yeah. But to hunt something that's mature, that's seen everything, and that has, I don't, I don't, I can, I love it because of the the drive of it. But the biggest thing is you got to look at it on the conservation side. Is I'm hunting an animal that has given back to its to its species. So if I shoot a one year old deer, that has not that that deer right there has not given back to its species. It's taken it's taken food source for a full year, but it's not delivered a baby right so, so it has not given back not spreading its dna yeah yeah but but if you shoot a four-year-old deer its genes are spread throughout everything and the problem is if you have too many of the animals they start crossbreeding because their genes are everywhere mm -hmm. so you there's there is a real safe number it's just what is the safe number so for alligators it's completely different because they're animals that unfortunately are not researched enough I think that we should. I mean, it's one of the animals that, that they don't even in the wild can't tell you how old an animal is. Like, you know, they, they lose teeth and they grow a new tooth. So you can't judge them by their teeth like a whitetail. Right. You know, and they, they're the only way they can judge an alligator at this point in the wild um, is by for like two or three years, they tag them and nobody ever kills them. Now, can you can you size up a, an alligator and get a general idea that's somewhat accurate of how old it may be based on how how large it is, or is that Not, just too? I mean, no. I, I believe no. Everybody has their own aspect that they think. So, the rule of thumb is in Florida we have the fastest growing alligators in the country, and for the first, what is it like the first six years? I think they grow an inch a year, or uh, yeah, an inch a year, an inch a year. Okay. No, a foot a year for the first six years. That, and then okay, every that. year after that, after they hit six, like essentially they hit maturity, what they consider sexual maturity. After they hit sexual maturity, it goes to an inch a year. And we have the maximum growth we have is two inches a year. So we're considered on the high end because we don't have, we have mild winters. So, so our gators grow continuously versus 
you know, the Carolinas or even Georgia gets really cold, you know, Louisiana gets cold. <coughs> we have, we don't have winters. So our animals continuously grow. I mean, you're talking now, about. Is, is part of that due, sorry to interrupt, is part of that due to this, the activity? Because I mean, they're being a reptile, cold-blooded animals when the environment's colder, they're less active. So with, with it being warmer active. in Florida throughout the year, they're more active, they're eating more, they're able to consume more energy. Well, they're it's, able to, it's digestion. To grow more. Yeah, okay. so it's, it's purely on the animal. So in, in, in cold states, I mean, even in this state, even in the state of Florida, like a, a hot climate, if you have a giant alligator and it, it, it could eat one, it, it can technically eat one big meal a year. A year. Wow. It's, it's wild. Like this is information that nobody knows. And I didn't even know this until I, I know mean, it was that I, long. Like I knew reptiles yeah, can go so a long time I thought it meals, was months. but damn. Yeah, I thought it was months. So if they eat a big, a big pig or a, a deer or something, they can literally last a year if they need to, but they don't. They don't need to, but they can. Hmm. That's for, you know, survival rates. As far as what they eat, I mean, you have continuous food source as far as small fish, birds, turtles, everything here. But they're big food source. They, the big gators usually eat a, one big meal a year. Wow. The smaller gators eat continuous all the time, but no big meals because they can't, they can't take a, a deer down. They can't take a pig down. Right. And so that's how our animal growth goes here. I mean, we, have, we don't have winters. Even, even in our cold fronts, you'll see a massive change of behavior massive change in hurricanes we have we have behavior differences that that hunter most gator hunters can't figure out why are they acting different it's because they know the storm's coming before a storm's even there it's all barometric pressure changes it's all sorts of stuff that that we think we have it because we have doppler radars and this and this but that animal is going to figure out that storm way before a human ever will even with our technology that's the beauty of the outdoors yeah they're, they know it before we know it, and we're the smart ones somehow. Right. And it's, just, it's so amazing some of the instincts, the instincts these animals have. I mean, I mean, look at the salmon going upstream to, to breeding grounds. You look at Correct. Uh, monarch butterflies traveling from, from Canada to Mexico every couple of years to these, these massive migrations based purely on instincts. I mean, just look at like a bird coming out of, out of an egg. How's that thing know how to fly? You know, right. like, like people can have... barely walk for years. Yeah. And you've yeah. got like like oh uh, um like I had my my dad's uh, had a cow that had, had gave birth not that long ago, or actually a couple of years ago. But I think this calf is up and walking around. You know, it's amazing. Plus, yep. we did. So we have. Eaten, but. They give us our a lot of tags, and and there's a difference of, you know, there's we have a lot of new hunters, is what you call it for gator hunting. We have more new hunters than than any other uh, other uh, hunting hobby. You know, they have, we have huge numbers of deer hunters, but most of them are, you know, passed down generationally, like their dad's hunt. So they taught them that gator hunting is just a wild thing. And it's not just us as Floridians, it's, it's nationwide. Everyone, like, it's just such a unique experience. Everyone wants to do it, which mm -hmm. is cool. I mean, that's, that's why I like doing it. It's, it's, it's literally a dinosaur. Yeah. You know, you're hunting something that's, that's been here literally forever. So, and because of that, they're smart. But it's not even it's not even a smart animal. That's what I tell people. I'm like they're not smart. They just have instincts that is far past ours. Like humans have changed and developed over the years, you know, from from cavemen. But but alligators have essentially been actual alligators for a very long time. So their species itself, their exact genetical difference has been here forever. You know, for yeah, as long as for, for as long as time. any, yeah. So for as long as all of us have been here, and because of that, they've kind of developed what they what they need to know to survive. And so you'll have, you know, I've killed three of the biggest gators that have been killed in the state ever, and those three gators, I have. Obviously, we're excited, but like when things settle down, your excitement leaves, and you and you look at it, and you're like, that thing's seen the development of our entire country, you know. It's arguable how old it is, but some people say 80, 100 years old. So if it's 100 years old, it's seen, it's seen the growth of our country since, I mean, there's been no houses on these, on these lakes in 100 years. Right. You and know? the amount of development. I, I mean, just the development that you and I have seen in the past, like, what, 30 plus years or whatever. You know, we've been walking around years. this place. You know, yep. it's, it's absolutely, like, like I talked about my home, yep. changed completely. It's all subdivisions now, pavement, and you can't, you don't get that nature attachment like right. I used to when I was growing up. And but. they adapt to it. Yep. But we can't, we as humans can't adapt to this, but they can figure out how to adapt to it. And that's the, 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 the nature thing that, that you go out there and you see these, 
I mean, you'll see alligators that I'd say a, 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 it's not like it's not rare. Like it's a high percentage of alligators will pull up are missing a leg or half their tail, which is called a bobtail alligator, or they're missing half their jaw, which is like pure bone. And they're missing wow. huge portions of it because of what they've experienced in the wildlife with other alligators and such. And because of that, you would think that they would not survive, but they somehow did. It's amazing. So they're, I mean, they're incredible animals at the same time. That is what, that's what drew me to them. But then once I drew me to them, I figured out the animal and, and, and it's, it's much more than that, you know, and I think that people need to see it, you know, people need to see, it's not just this, everyone has their own thing, but this just happens to be my thing. Go look at the animal, go, go, you can love it. I love it. Let's go look at it, you know? Yeah. But once you see that species and you see it up close and you realize it's really not, it's not the cute, it's not the cute animal you thought it was, you yeah, know, I mean, it's, it's a dinosaur. Yeah, I've got an 18 foot boat. It's a pretty decent sized boat as far as is um, I've got a high sided boat like it's it's built for gator hunting. I've hunted for 15 plus years for alligators. It's built for gator hunting. And you'll have these things coming up next to the boat. And people are like, I'm not comfortable. I'm like, yeah. exactly. That's yeah. you're supposed to be not comfortable. That's the idea of this. Yeah. You know, it's an apex predator. It's 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 no different than us. It's just as as successful in life as we are. It's just in a different world. You know, mm -hmm. like they're in fact, if if things went downhill, that animal is still going to be here. We won't for oh, yeah. certain, for certain. Oh yeah. He's not worried about nuts. formula shortages or, or gas prices or supply chains. Like he's fine. Not at all. Not at all worried about food source. Not at all worried about, you know, we worry about, Oh, how many white tail are there, but there's always enough white tail for a deer to eat or for a gator to eat. That's the thing is it's, it's how many gators there are and they'll self-regulate. And so will deer and so will coyotes. And so will tortoises, but at the end of the day, every one of those will have faults if we don't, if we don't regulate with them. And if we have, if we, if it's, if it's a resource that that's renewable, why shouldn't we be allowed to, to go, go take it and eat it, you know? Especially if, know, it's, if there's potential for it to actually improve the ecosystem in other ways as well. It, it's a win-win every way you look at it. It is, but it's not to some people, but that's why I try and sit down with people. And say you so, just so you realize, these this number of alligators the state's going to want to kill regardless. It's just is the state paying money or, or are they gaining money? Right. So it's two hundred and seventy two dollars for me to apply for alligator tax. Wow, that's so, a how many yeah. people apply for these every year? You said nineteen thousand people. That's a so lot that, of money. I don't remember what it was, but they made they made like six million dollars, like a week and a half ago. The Jeez. state did. Yeah, it was 19, it was 70, so, I mean, I'll tell you right now, 7,400 tags, and this is just if only state people took this. So you have 7,400 tags, and it's 280 bucks a tag, essentially. That's 2 million there, but the big, the, where their big funding comes in is, is an out-of-stater is $1,000 to apply. And do you know what kind of numbers um, apply from out-of-state? Yeah, well, they have huge numbers that apply from out of state. And that's something that new gator hunters complain that, oh, I can't get tags because out of staters are applying. That's not it. If you're a new gator hunter, you're one of the reasons we can't get because I, I was here before it was big. But before yeah. me, they're complaining about me. So it's just a it's just a it's a hobby. I mean, it, it, this year I think we had like five percent, less than five percent. I think it's three percent. The ledger just came out with it on the numbers, it's like 3% of the tags allocated so far on phase one were from out of state. And there's still tags available. The problem okay, well, it's is- a very small percentage. Hunt, it's very small, it's very small. But, but and we're, they're supposed to keep it under 10, was the deal. Seems reasonable. But people, people, it's super reasonable. It's the same thing that elk, uh, you know, elk, like, like high intensity hunts, you know, high dollar hunts. There's, there's, you can go on uh, mountain goat or bighorn sheep hunts that if you draw a tag, whether or not you kill the animal, you will never draw, you are not eligible to ever draw it again in your life. So they're once in a life, but they're truly once in a lifetime wow, tags. Wow, okay. Yeah. And, and the tags that they give you, you, you have to kill specific size of animal, which obviously then gives you age. Right. So these these guides charge ten or fifteen thousand dollars a hunt for some of these hunts 
because they have to know these people have to watch these rams and these and these goats and these gators or whatever they watch them year round they watch them year round because they only their their clients are paying so much they only get one shot at it and so you want you obviously want a high success rate if you want right. to be a good guide you know and so that's what it is as far as guiding goes is it's it's with gators it's you want a high success rate, but it's about an experience. A lot of these people that come out with us, man, it's, it's, I've had people that come out and we didn't go an alligator, whether it's weather or condition, any sort of conditions, or we hook gators and they pulled the hook on them. Whatever happens, happens. It's, it's the success rate is pretty low, but the idea of a guide is we, we have a higher success rate than others, but it's not guaranteed. It's never guaranteed. Right. You know, there's no guarantee on it. And what happens with that is, is those people, your number one option should be to give them the best experience in their life. And that's the, that's the goal of it is to give them that Florida experience. Most of these people are out of state that we take out, but some of these people are in state and they've never done it and they don't know what to do. And so they just go out there and they have that experience. And then they, they turn in from somebody that wanted to do it one time in their life to they want to do it every year. And their kids are involved and these people come become ex obsessed with wildlife or the outdoors or I don't care if the kid becomes obsessed with hunting. I told my son, I don't care if you hunt, just love the outdoors, join, join the outdoors, get outside. We, we used to be able to go run in the streets, but we can't now. Right. And that, that's not the kid's fault. That's our fault. You know, like we have people that'll come steal kids now, but they need to be able to get outside. They need to be able to get off their phone. We do too. We yell at our, I yell at my kids all the time about getting off the phone and I'll sit it, I'll sit on my phone in front of a TV while on my phone until 2 a.m. sometimes. Oh, dude, today's so, been terrible. Like I've been trying, I've been really hustling, trying to get some, some side business stuff out there. I've been working on podcast stuff, networking. I, I've been on my phone yeah. all day. I set it down. Like I, I'm going outside. I went, I went to the store, I went for a little walk. And I'm like, I need this dedicated time. And I'm one of those people that, that grew up like in that hunting environment. But now like, I think the last couple of times I went out to the woods, I, I don't think I've even carried a rifle. I just had my, I just had a pistol, a yeah. rattlesnake or something, but like, I just wanted to be out there in the nature. Yeah. And for me, I, yep. I love it, you know? And of course, if something came up and, you know, if the opportunity, what, you know, I'll probably take a shot, but it's, for me, it's absolutely about being part of this, this beautiful environment. I mean, again, I've had, I've had generations of my family growing up or living in central Florida, everything from raising cattle to like the original OG Florida crackers with the loud whips because you're hunting cattle yeah. in marshes Correct. and woods. You know, so like, like when it comes down to it, it's like the, the heritage. So like it connects me to my roots or my cypress right. knees, so to speak. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's such a great uh, experience. We have things that some people like, I'm always, I'm, I'm, I'm pro let people what they want to do. So, you know, you have dog hunters, like I'm not a big dog hunter. I'm, I don't like, I don't like it. You know, like I don't like dog hunting. I, I, I feel like it's, it's not necessary, but at the same time, I'm not against dog hunting. You know, because I don't believe in just because I don't like something doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to hold on to it. I also don't believe that you should be able to do it just because of heritage. If the resource is there, then allow it. Right. But if the resource isn't there, then it's not allowable, you know? And so with gator hunting, that's the problem is people don't realize that animal, if, if I go kill it, you'll be upset. But here's the deal. It, it could it could swim from your house to the next door neighbor's house and they're going to call a trapper and that trapper's going to have to kill it right then what happens do you, do you know what happens to the to the gators after they get killed by a trapper like is that is that meat utilized is there any other is it yeah, it's, it's killed it's well yeah, I mean, like, so is it, is it, is it, it used dump to the be, bodies or they use it somehow no, no 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 so um gator the hide the hide market used to be big so you know for whatever making belts and and all sorts of Cool clothes. The, the, yeah. the problem is that the hide market got real high to where we were getting paid. I mean, you, this is about when you met me was when the well, hide market was insane. Oh, so really? that's okay. when I became good at gator hunting because I was going through my divorce. So I had to have a different source of income and I happened to be good at hunting and I figured out how to do this to where I could make money on it. The bigger the gator, the more money. And it's not just bigger, more money. It was per foot you get more per foot as bigger you got. So I had to not only hunt gators, but I had to hunt big gators to make it worth it. Right. So, and this is back before swamp people. So this was when you could get a ton of tags. 
So we'd get a lot of tags and we'd sell the alligators. So like you can't go sell a white tailed deer. Mm -hmm. You can sell yeah. an alligator because alligators are considered like you have to buy a trapping license is the license you get is a trapping license. That's just wild. Yeah, it is. So, so the crazy. trapping license, but you mentioned like, it's not like we don't do the trapping here like they do in like Louisiana or some other states, but you do get a trapping license for it. Is that just so you can, is that Correct. the commercial so we're, aspect We're given a trapping license, but like what they do in like on Swan People, they hang baits and they right. do it. They now do it because the show has become so big. They do it mul multiple methods. But if you look at the original seasons of Swan People, all they were doing is hanging baits. Yeah. And they hang baits and they go pick up the baits the next day. You know, and so that's that is true trapping. And so the only people that are allowed to do that in the state of Florida now are nuisance trappers. They're allowed mm -hmm. to like if you have a if you have an alligator that came after your dog or has become aggressive towards you, you're allowed to set a bait for it as a nuisance trapper. Okay. But that's through the state. So they have to get licensed through the state to do that. It's not easy to do. Okay. But as a normal gator hunter, we have a season. They do it 365 days a year. We get 77 days and we do it as a they give us a season to hunt them as a sport, as a hobby, you know, as a huntable season. We get the season and what they, the reason they give us that specific season is before they're fully mated, but like it's not mating season, it's not hatching season. So we hunt them outside of all these seasons. So we're not, kill, we're not killing off baby. Like if you kill a mom, if you kill a female by chance, you're not killing a bunch of babies. If you kill a big male, you're not, I mean, you may be in months preventing him from breeding, but you're not preventing him from breeding that moment because it's not breeding season. Right. Okay. So, so you're not interrupting the natural the flow of things necessarily. Correct. So that, that's why, they, I mean, that's what deer season is. That's what all the seasons are. Right. And so they, they have developed it over time to, to figure out how they do it. We cannot set hook lines. We can't set baits. So we, we have to hunt them in a less traditional sense than like swamp people, they go hang baits. We have to actually hunt the animal. And so it becomes, a, the reason we call it spore hunting is because you have to physically chase the alligator, you know, and, and a gator, like a gator can go down, they can stay down underwater for a couple hours. And that doesn't mean they go down and stay in the same spot. They could end up a mile away. Mm -hmm. You could never see that animal again. So you have to, as a person, figure out and learn the habits of the animal if you want to be really successful, you have to learn the animal and then you have to learn the weather. And then you have to learn the area you're going to hunt. So some people only want to hunt one area and they get really good at that area for their whole life. And that's awesome. My goal has always been learn the animal, which I did, learn weather, which I did. And now I'm learning as many areas as I can. So I want to seems... figure out the animal in every area. Yeah. Well, I mean, it seems like if you understand the, the animal. Is to kill the state record. So what is, I do want to um, ask about some of the, I've had eight minutes left on this one, um, but uh, so what are some of the largest um, animals you've harvested? So I think, I think it's like 14 two or something like that. What is that, Justin? Look it up, State Florida, Florida State, Florida, Florida State Alligator Record. I think it's like 14 two. And for reference, what's like an average, you'd say? Uh, like, like gators like I mean, harvested. if you go out there, an average is like three feet. Okay, so you have to know how to differentiate. I mean, if you're so previous, when I first started gator hunting, what is it? 14, three and a half. 14, three and, a half. and what was yours? So 13, 10 and a half. Hell yeah, bud. You're almost there. Inches away, man. Story that's, of my life. That's awesome. Yeah, right. Just a few <laughs> inches away. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, that was, I mean, th what's nuts about that is you think about like that's inches away. That's 10 more years. That's 10 That's more right. years of growth yeah. or it's ge different genetics because we kill some 10 footers that you can tell are like old, worn out warriors that their teeth are falling out. Like they, they have half their teeth and then you can kill the same size animal that that's just looks real young, real vibrant teeth that has still has its bars on its side, which is like all the colors and stuff. Yeah. You know, you it's, it's, I truly believe, I don't believe you can judge an alligator I believe it's just like any other animal. It's genetic. It's genetics. Like a white tail, some deer will never be a giant buck. Some deer will just be a small buck its whole life. It can, it will get bigger, but it will get minutely bigger. You know, right. alligators are the same thing. Um, I don't. I feel like that's what it is. But the only information we have on how they grow is like Gatorland. You know, which is a farm. Which is it's it's unreasonable to say that that's how they deal with it in the wild. They get fed chicken every day. 
they don't have yeah. to move much. That's a farm animal. It's a farm yeah, they're animal. They're not surviving. They're so, subsisting. They're not they're yeah, not working so the for only it. They're not moving they, around. Yeah, the only way we can get research on this is is by putting more money into it and tagging them. And when people kill an animal that's tagged, find out how old that was. You know, how old, how big was it when you tagged it? And how big was it when you killed it? So they had that research for a while and nobody the problem is alligators are smart, man. Nobody killed the animals. They're still out there. They still have the tags. I've got, I mean, we've killed two tagged alligators, and it's the only two I've ever heard. In fact, I've heard of one of them. So I've heard of three in my entire life, and I have two of them. Wow. My boat has two, not me personally. But my, my crew has two of them right. personally. And we don't even know. We, we've never even called them in and asked the research on it. Like, that's what's nuts is because you're not going to, who is going to go out there and tag a 10-footer? Like live wrestle a ten foot alligator and put a tag on it, and then realistically, I mean the the GPS locators and all the stuff they have for animals now, like for sharks and stuff, they tag stuff. They have GPS locators, but that stuff's set for a different world. Like these animals go into the the woods that literally humans have not seen since the Indians, you know, since Native Americans. So there's spots out there in the swamp on the St. Johns River that nobody's been. Nobody, nobody. It's not, it's not reachable. And that's the beauty of getting out there and realizing, like, whoa, we're not this big, you know, we're not as big as we thought. Like, we're small. The world oh, yeah. is huge. These animals are huge. They know where to go, you know, and that's, that's the, that is what keeps, that's what brought my drive to this. And now my drive is watching other people get involved with the outdoors and, and getting that excitement. But as far as the gator sizes, there's no guarantee on, they estimate is all they do because the only growth rates they have is based on farm gator alligator farms okay which is so un there's, unrealistic there's really no true to way to tell you how old an animal is interesting yeah so that, you, know, you have a 14 three and a half from florida i think somebody in like louisiana at some point i think somebody killed a 15 you know wow, so you're talking about animals insanely big animals once you get when you first start gator hunting and you bring an eight footer up and you look at it, you're like, I'm six foot tall. I bring an eight footer up and I was like, that's a huge animal, you know? And then yeah. now I bring an eight footer up and I'm like, turn that one loose. Let's go get a different, one. <laughs> you yeah. know, that's the, that's what's crazy. Right. The people that are with me are like, what are you doing? Like, that's insane. Yeah. It's an eight foot, it's an eight foot lizard. I'm trying to think so, like the first, I think the first, I got lucky on the first whitetail I actually shot. I think my brother got like a six point or four point when he was younger. But then my first one I got was an eight point, 161 pound whitetail deer, which is big for Florida. Yeah. yeah. For Florida, it's huge. For all the, like anywhere, Georgia, or South Carolina, even it's not that big, yeah. but for here it was big. I think it's the camp record for a year or so before I got uh, uprooted, but like it's, it's, I love that there are people like you out there and, and, and all this attention that's coming to, you know, it's a double-edged sword having the, the gator hunting and this kind of thing become more popular. Because like on the one hand, like it's tougher for you to do what you love, but also just bring a lot more resources to continue these beautiful animals existing and researching it, learning more about them and finding more sustainable ways to continue doing what we're doing, what we'd love to do. So it's, it's double-edged sword, but it seems to me like from talking with you, it seems like things are moving in a very positive direction. I mean, I hope, I hope it is. I mean, you always depend on, on others, what direction you're going to go. So you know, what politicians you have, what, you know, I believe both sides. So I believe there needs to be an opposite side. Otherwise hunters are going to want to take everything. That's just, yeah. that's just humans, natural habitat. You know, like that's what we want to do. Yeah. So we have to have that balance of, of the anti to have a positive outcome. The truth of the matter is we, we do put a ton of money into conservation. You know, we, we, the only reason, if you look at like Ducks Unlimited, 100% of the money you donate to Ducks Unlimited goes to Duck Habitat. It's, it's the only organization that I know of that 100% of your money goes to it. That's amazing. And, and the habitat that you create with Ducks Unlimited is not, is not necessarily huntable. Most 90% of the, 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 uh, the habitat that they buy, they purchase, is not huntable because of that bird needs to rest. Mm -hmm. So they, they, you know, hunters aren't all bad. You know, they don't, they, we're all looked at as the same, but we're all different people. We right. all come from different ways. And that's why I've always tried to like open, if you want to have a conversation, come to me and talk, but bring some knowledge because I'm going to give you some knowledge and it's real world knowledge. It's not what I've read. I didn't it's read experience. this on, correct. 
And if, and if you want to experience like, let's go, but I don't want to be, the last thing I want to do is be bashed, you know, like that giant alligator I killed the news wanted to do a story on it. And like, I was amped, like I wanted to go do it. And then the first thing I thought of is, you know what, man, like that my kids are going to have a brick thrown through their window. And if I do that. So I, and all that. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So that's what it is, is, is they can, they can, they water it down and they turn this into a, uh, it wasn't, you know, it was a pet essentially, which they're not, you know, and there's a whole lot more to that too, but we're so down the last minute, but dude, like, like I said, like, I'm really glad people like you are out there. Thank you so much for talking with me. And I want like these conversations, hopefully people learn more about it through conversations like you're willing to have with me right now. And then when they see someone get, you know, a, a big, large alligator or a large animal, they're like, okay, I understand how the context of it much more now. And they're less likely to villainize those who do it. So that's dude, what it is. Yeah. So thank you again so much, man. I get sorry about the time constraints. We'll figure it all out later. Eventually we'll have that big cigar whiskey time and it'll be good. I got a big studio, but till then, bro, thank you so much. And I'll uh, talk to you later, man. All right. All right. Peace, bro. Bye.